Hello, everyone. My name is Rajesh Pichaimani, and I'm a solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. Hello, my name is Neil Mehta, and I'm a solutions architect at AWS as well. Together, we will be co-presenting this two-part series of mastering the S3 permissions. This is the first of the series. Let's get started with the agenda. What we'll be covering today is setting up the stage to introduce you to various mechanisms for managing S3. And then we will dive some deep dives into the access control list, which is a legacy mechanism, but still an interesting topic to discuss. We'll spend a good amount of time in the bucket policies, which is a commonly used one. Finally, we will wrap up with some tools to help you generate good permission policies and resource policies. Before we conclude the session, we will also give a preview of what's coming up next. In terms of access management for S3, there are three various ways. The first one is the identity-based policies, where we attach the required permissions to the identity principles. It can be users, rules, or groups. Second one is access control list that we will talk about next. And the third mechanism is the bucket policies for S3 and in categorically generalized as resource-based policies. In terms of access control list, this applies to both bucket as well as the object level. And we say it's a legacy because it predates the IAM-based method of managing the objects in the buckets. In the earlier situation, going back in time, when the apples are enabled, the object writer is the original owner, even though if the object is returned to a different bucket in a different account. There are several advantages back at the time, one of them being providing a finer access control to each object within the bucket. For example, if a bucket holds 10 objects, each of them is written by a different object writer. Each can have a different set of permissions granting to different users or applications downstream who will be consuming the object. This works well in theory as well as in practice. But at the same time, when we come to looking at this at scale, it becomes challenging to manage and maintain. As all enterprises use this S3 as a storage layer with hundreds and thousands and millions of objects, it becomes hard to manage, as you can imagine. So right now, at present, the default behavior is actors are disabled. And you will be seeing the new version or the new way of uh, managing in the next few slides. I want to give this preview of screenshot of how it looks like in a default behavior. Like as I mentioned, the access control list portion is disabled. And also the fact that the object ownership is retained by the bucket as of now. When we switch to the demo, I will show you the situation where we turn back the original situation of turning the apples and what we can do and how we can do, etc. This is to get the glimpse of what we, see, we will see at present when you create the buckets. I'll transition to Neil. Hello, everyone. For those that have a single AWS account and want to allow users and roles to, uh, access to your S3 bucket, you will need an, either an IAM policy or a bucket policy that has an allow statement for the required actions. An IAM policy is considered to be an identity policy, and a bucket policy is considered to be a resource policy. Resource policies are attached directly to an AWS resource, in this case, an S3 bucket, while an identity policy is attached to attached directly to an IAM entity. In this case, we are attaching the IAM policy to an IAM user or role in the bucket owner's account. For example, let's take a look at, a, at the IAM policy A example. When you attach this policy to an IAM user or role, you allow them to issue the list, get, put, and delete request on the example bucket. Let's explore the actions that we are allowing in this policy further. 
with S3, you can grant access for users to perform account level, bucket level, and object level actions. You may have noticed that the get, put, and delete actions all have the object in their name. For example, get object, put object, and delete object. These are considered to be object level actions, whereas list has bucket in its name. For example, list bucket. Thus, list bucket is considered to be a bucket level action. With S3, if you're working with account level, bucket level, or object level actions in your policy, you must ensure that you are using the coinciding account level, bucket level, or object level resource on. Now let's explore the resource part in this policy. As you can see, we have two resource ons defined in this part of the policy. The first on has just a bucket name. This is considered to be a bucket level resource on. Since a list bucket action is a bucket level action, we must use the appropriate bucket level resource on in our policy. The second on has a bucket name followed by a forward slash and an asterisk. This is considered to be a object level resource on. Since the since the get object, put object, and delete object actions are all on object uh, are, in a, are all an object level action, we must use the appropriate object level resource on in our policy. Because you only need to have an allow statement in either the IM policy or the bucket policy, you can alternatively also just configure a bucket policy for each user or role that provides the required information. For example, let's take a look at bucket policy A. In this, in this uh, policy, we allow all users and roles in the AWS account that ends with 1111 to perform the list, get, put, and delete actions on the example bucket. This policy is sufficient enough to allow all users and roles in your AWS account access to this bucket. You do not need to have an IM policy that allows these actions if you have a bucket policy configured like this example. Now, what if you want to only allow specific users or roles access to a particular bucket in your AWS account? Well, we can use a bucket policy. To allow user one and role two access to the example bucket. Again, user one and role two would not need an IM policy with an allow statement to access the example bucket. If you have configured a bucket policy like the one in bucket policy B example. So now that you understand how to grant access to a bucket with either IM an IM policy or a bucket policy. Let's take a look at how AWS recommends to configure a bucket policy for single account access. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to use the preferred method of using AWS policies to manage access to S3 buckets. So here we have two policies configured, an IAM policy and a bucket policy. The IAM policy is configured to, uh, to allow the required actions on the example bucket. We would want to attach this IAM policy to user one and role two. The bucket policy is configured to allow all users and roles, all actions on the example bucket, if the requester is not user one or role two. We would want to attach this bucket policy to our example bucket. Together, these policies will effectively only allow user one and role two to perform the list, get, put, and delete actions on the example bucket. The bucket policy will deny all other users from accessing the bucket. We recommend using allow statements in your IAM policies and conditional deny statements in your bucket policy to lock down access to your S3 buckets. Now I'm going to hand it off back to Rajesh to talk more about some of our best practices. Thank you, Neil. Here are some of the best practices that we would like to share with you. The first one is using the capability called IAM Access Analyzer for S3 to, to understand how the buckets are shared. For example, if you have been using this S3 for a very long time in your organization, chances are you might have started with access control list as an access management mechanism earlier. And then over the course, when the bucket resource policies 
came into picture, you would have started sharing using resource based policy, bucket policy. So to understand and give a snapshot of which ones are shared through which method, you will use this capability. And we will touch on this when we come to the demo portion as well. This gives a good snapshot of those buckets with actors configured. And you will be taking this list to have a transition plan to the bucket policy method. The second one is keeping all the public buckets in a dedicated AWS account. Also, if you're an S3 user, you would have known that all the S3 buckets are by default private. However, there are use cases like website hosting. For example, this needs to be open up to the public. In these cases, you do not want to mix and match those buckets, certain buckets which are private, certain buckets which are open to public. So the recommendation here is to combine all of those two buckets which needed private access, have it in a dedicated account, and keep the rest of them private in a, other ones. This way, you know for sure that this dedicated AWS account have all the buckets opened up for public. And this also, from the security point of view, limits the blast radius. The third one is to transition to bucket policies that Neil just covered in a few slides ago over access control lists. Bucket policies provides a lot of advantages. And so have a transition plan for the access control list buckets. Last but not the least is using an IAM access analyzer's capability called unused access findings to refine the permissions over time. This is to enforce the principle of least privilege, and that needs to be seen as a journey over a period of time to continuously monitor and periodically monitor what permissions are used and unused for certain users, roles, etc. And as and when you see these unused access findings, you can terminate and revoke those because it may not have been used for a very long time. If you are a part of the storage team in your organization, chances are you will be coming up with a lot of uh, permission and um, resource-based policies regularly. And S3 in general, you will have to have this link handy to come up with the latest and uh, most recent information about the components that go into the policies, actions, resources, and condition. The first one effect is a simple allow or deny. So we are going to cover the action, resource, and condition in much greater detail in the demo as well. Suffice to say, this table will give you what actions are valid and what are the dependencies, what are the constraints, criteria, etc. And what is the link between an action and a corresponding resource condition, which one is mandatory, which one is not. And also, when we say resources, two things come into mind immediately, the bucket and the object, but there are certain other things that go for advanced level use cases that we will touch upon as well. And last but not the least, the conditions. One of the examples that we saw in the previous slide is string not equals for a specific user or role. Likewise, there are several other conditions that we can have a look at it. And depending upon the use case, you might want to check with them periodically. Next, we will switch to the console and walk through some of the scenarios that we just talked about. Let me switch to the console to walk you through the capabilities that we just saw. Here is my console with the S3 section. I'm going to use one of the buckets for the sake of illustration here. In this permissions tab, if you come down, you will see two elements. The first one is the access control list, which is grayed out because it is default disabled. To enable this, go to edit, actors enabled, so object writer and save changes. When you come back, this 
element is enabled, access control list. We can turn this on to make some changes in the access control list. This is a non-default behavior, by the way. Here, there are three kinds of important elements. The grantee, either it can be a owner, everyone with public access, authenticated users, and there can be certain services or application that might need to write the logs to a certain S3 bucket. So that's this scenario. And you can also add grantees using the canonical ID. For each of the grantees, you have two different categories where you can allow the permissions, either the objects, some of them have list and write, and some of them just list, and the bucket ACL. Right now, I am the owner of this account, so I have the ability to read and write, and that's why the changes, I can do it. But for others, you can only read them, and for log delivery group, it has to write as well. So this is a way that you can make some edits through access control edits at the bucket level. Once you have saved the changes, you can also go to the objects within the bucket and have similar permissions applied at the object level. Very similar view you see, the grantee, the objects, and the object ACL. Now that I'm going to go back to the default settings by disabling it. Once I put back to the default behavior, you see the object ownership comes back to the bucket owner and the access control list is disabled. This is the first information that we saw earlier in the slides. Second one is block public access settings. This can be done at the account level, meaning this applies to all the buckets within this account. At the same time, you can go into the object level as well, bucket level, and change this settings, block public access bucket level. So two places you can see, one at the account level and one at the bucket level. The other one that we saw is the IAM access analyzer for S3. Here you will see in a bit the various buckets in the account, how it was shared. Through. And this is shared through bucket policy. This view might be different for your case where you might have some of them through bucket policy and some through ACL. And this is the starting point to transition from a older mechanism to the new bucket policy based access management. Another one that I wanted to share with you is the IAM access analyzer, unused access findings. So we have these few findings. This is the IAM resource, either in the IAM role or down below we have some user as well. The users. Each of them have certain permission that are unused. So we'll, you will use this information to start revoking the permissions that are not unused because they probably were not needed right away. And that way you are enforcing the principle of least privilege. Just before we switch to the demo, we also talked about this link that has the actions, resources, and conditions. So first we'll start with the actions. This table has different information here. This starts with the actions sorted in alphabetical order. The description of it and what resource types are needed. If it is object, then it is an object resource as need mentioned in the example. The object resource has to be mentioned in the resource category of the policy. And this star indicates it's a mandatory one. And optionally condition keys. 
like was mentioned before, there are different actions that can be done at the account level, object level, and the bucket level. So start with a couple of examples here. Get account public access block. This is getting the details about the block public access setting at the account level. Since we are extracting the information, this is a read activity. And this is at the account level, so the resource type is nothing is mandated. And if you leave it as it is, it's uh, at the account level. And another example is list all my buckets. This is again at the account level. As you're seeing here, there is no mandated resource type which gives the information about all the buckets. Another unique account level activity is a job. It is creating a job set configuration, which means it is writing back to uh, S3. So it's a write operation and it's at the account level as well. The uniqueness is this is the only uh, action that needs a required conditions. I am pass role. So that's why we wanted to highlight this um, action. Next is the bucket level information. Very common one is this bucket. The way to interpret this uh, operation is listing all the objects in this particular bucket. And what bucket that is specified in the resource ARN and it's a mandated one. Because if you have 10 buckets, for example, and if you want to list bucket, means the system has to know that which bucket you are pulling up the object's information from. That's why bucket information is mandatory. Another example is in the bucket policy. We talked about in the previous slides. Uh, creating a bu bucket policies when need touched on it. To extract what the information is about, you can use this action. Get me all the uh, bucket policy for a specific bucket. That's a reading operation. For most of the scenarios, you will see very descriptive names that gives it away just by looking at the name of the action. And last but not the least, in the action table, one particular object level example is get object in the information about the object. And obviously we need the object name. So that's why the object resource is mandated. Likewise, there are many of them. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the next component, which is the resource type. As briefly touched upon, the very common resources are the objects in the buckets that you will list this way in the policies as Amazon resource names, ARNs. And this partition indicates which partition. And in most of the cases, if you have a, a public region, then it would be AWS. If there are regions in China, then it would be AWS-CN. And if it is a Go clone, it is US-Go, AWS-US-Go. That's the partition that segregates, and then you will specify in this structure. The uncommon ones, depending upon the use cases, can be uh, access point, resource types, storage lens, configuration, object, lambda, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we emphasize, and if you're part of the storage team in your organization for cloud, you might want to have this bookmark. So whenever you are creating policies, you have the valid information in, in those policies and um, to like make it life easier. The last table is the condition key in this link, provides the different condition keys for S3. These are optional, just to tighten the, the locks here. The very common one is the AMC server-side encryption, where you can enforce policies telling deny writing objects to a bucket if the encryption is not turned on, which is S3 encryption, right? 
So this particular example illustrates the fact that you need to have this. And if the string is not equals in the condition, then it will deny the object putting back into the bucket, example bucket. So that's this link. Next one is if you have already created a policy, you may want to validate before you put it in production. So you can find this link useful to validate them. It can be users, rules, or groups. I'm going to select this particular user, which have one administrative uh, access as a policy. But for the illustration's sake, I'm going to walk you through the example. Once you select the policy, most likely in a real life scenario, it might be any other policies, which can be multiple of them, by the way, and they may not all be administrative, be only for a specific role that you are trying to create. You can create a, select the service, either an API gateway or a EC2, for example. I'm going to select all actions, or you can go back to Lambda, select all actions, select all. And I'm going to run the simulation to illustrate the message that this permission policy allows or not. So back here, clear the results, select the CLI. This is the policy, get areas. For example, run simulation. Here in ideal situation, you will see a message telling this permission is allowed by, by this policy. So you can use this as a validation point before you apply this into production. Last but not the least in the demo is, sometimes you might need some little help in generating the template, the JSON template in a structured form. So you can use this policy generator view and have all the elements in a UA form to create a policy. For example, we'll start with the effect allow. Ideally, you will you be using a specific principle as outlined in the example provided by me, either in a user or a role or an account. Again, for the illustration, I'm showing a principle star. Create access point, and it can be for any resource the statement and generate a policy. You can copy paste in a file, JSON file. And once the structure is put in place, then you can elaborate more statements and statement conditions within this to reflect your use case. So this is a good starting point to get, get over the policy document and start developing on its own. Now that we have seen everything in the demo, let me switch to the deck. Coming back to the slides here on the references, here are the few references that we think it's important. The first one is access management, obviously. The action resource condition that we just talked about, you might have to have this bookmarked and visit them very often. The two tools that we just saw in the demo, the policy simulator and the generator, and the IAM access analyzer as well. These three, these five references would be a good starting point to come back and revisit to stay connected with the latest capabilities. Thank you, thank you for your time. We hope you found this content useful. Thank you everyone for attending the our session today. Um, stay tuned for part two of the series where we'll cover multi-account access along with uh, more advanced permissions, concepts, and policies. Thank you. Thank you.